Cool. Um, so thank you, David, for um, inviting me to talk to you today about the Data Champions Program at Tertiary University. Um, so before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which uh, I'm presenting to you today, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so, There we go. Um, so I, I thought that the, before I um, start talking about how we um, run the Research Data Champion program, I'll take a step back and talk about why um, we uh, started this idea and um, what are the problems that we're trying to solve. Um, so back in 2019, um, as part of the Curtin e-research special interest group, um, we ran a survey aimed at understanding researchers' behaviour and needs in managing the research data. Um, I've included a link to the report in the slide, um, but I'm, ha I'm also happy to share the uh, slides with you as well later. Um, so one of the findings um, or some of the findings from that report um, shows that researchers are not aware of the research support services that are available to them um, and their understanding of data management good practices such as um, you know backup storage and data retention um, is a, can be a bit patchy. Um, and also um, at Curtin is such a large organization um, there are many potential touch points and sometimes researchers get conflicting information um, and that can be confusing and frustrating. Um, the data management needs that in, of our community is very diverse and sometimes uh, we just don't have the domain knowledge and resources to help everybody. So um, the, um, the way I framed our challenge at the time is um, how might we provide sustainable and just-in-time research data management services for busy researchers with very diverse needs? Um, so some of the um, ways we um, thought of addressing a challenge, um, uh, while we have very limited resources, it's not possible to, uh, that we run more workshops or do more training. Um, besides, we also saw attendance to generic workshops declining over time. Uh, so we thought at the time that's not a really good solution to our problem. Uh, so we need to rethink how we use our existing resources uh, that we have to achieve uh, bigger impact and increase our reach. We um, have already been um, collaborating with other areas in the university to leverage each other's expertise and resources in delivering uh, data management training. Um, we also developed some self-help guides that are very well used. Um, so it seemed to us that um, the support and services are there, uh, but the problem might be the lack of connections um, between researchers and support areas and needs to include um, the people, the infrastructure, training offerings, and uh, the online self-help information. Um, so we decided to look for ways to improve connections and engagement with researchers. Um, and that's how we um, decided to start running the Research Data Champion program. Um, so the objective of the program um, is to enable connection between researchers and research support area uh, and to create opportunities for the data champions to expand the network across disciplines and um, for us uh, as research support staff to better understand their challenges and needs. Um, we can also provide targeted training and support for uh, data champions so they will be more equipped to uh, improve their own data management practice and eventually help their peers, their colleagues and students. So um, the main goals um, of the program is to create connections and build relationships and to increase visibility of the library research data service. Uh, so what are the rights and duties as a data champion? Um, they will get targeted training and support on a range of topics that um, we have identified as uh, in scope of the program. So they are research reproducibility, uh, data management planning or um, 
research data management good practice and also the fair principles. Uh, we produce a public profile on the library website and we will see in the next slide um, uh, what they look like. Um, and as part of a community, they can also take advantage of the platform that we're building and the events that we organize to meet other researchers and research support staff across the university. Uh, they can, um, uh, they also get to decide what training topics we're going to focus on um, during the program and how the sessions should be run. Um, in return, we ask them to commit to attend and promote the events associated with the program and um, to use their connections and the influence within their schools and research groups uh, and share the data management knowledge and resources with their, um, with their peers and colleagues. So um, these are the data champions profiles. Um, so we recruit new data champions once a year um, with most of the data champions from 2020 stayed on the program. We now have 26 active data champions. This year we have a diverse group of data champions joined us. Uh, they are academic staff, um, professional uh, research support staff, and also higher degree by research students um, from across uh, quite a few faculties and departments. Um, they are also from um, various ge geographical locations, so they're not just based in Perth. Um, they're also from um, Adelaide, Sydney, Melbourne. Um, we also have one data champions from India and um, one from Brazil. So how is the program being run? Um, there, there is no cookbook to build a community. Um, so the way I ran the 2020 and 2021 programs is quite different um, as we review and revise how the program is run every year. And I expect that will continue to, uh, to evolve. Um, I, so I thought it might be useful for me to quickly run through how we ran the program last year. So in 2020, we, um, we are only partnering with academic staff. So we recruit them through um, the heads of school. Um, we had 10 data champions. Um, they attended four three hour training sessions at the beginning of the program. Um, and we caught up fortnightly during the program. We came up with a lot of things and ideas that um, we want to do, uh, but quickly ran out of time to finish all of them. Uh, I'm sure it's not a surprise, as we all know, uh, 2020 was uh, a bit difficult. I'm not saying 2021 was any, easy, any easier, um, but it was very hard. Um, so we wrapped up the program by running the uh, Research Data Champions Forum, uh, which was held in February this year. Uh, in the event, the data champions presented um, about the reflections and what they've gained from being a data champions. Um, and we also held an Ask Me Anything session with an expert panel. Uh, so um, we have invited um, some expert staff uh, from uh, the research office, our IT area, and also our records um, department. So that um, went quite well. Um, so based on the feedback from the data champions and the lessons learned from last year, um, I tried a different approach this year. Um, so instead of asking for nomination, I put a call out um, and uh, asked for people to self-nominate. Uh, so we ended up with 18 new research data champions and I already mentioned that they're from um, various areas and um, locations. Um, so, and instead of running the intensive training program, uh, like last year, the program was kickstarted with a workshop, an onboarding workshop. Um, so in the workshop, the data champions get to meet um, each other. Uh, we work through a self-assessment tool together, um, which helped the data champions to identify the knowledge gaps and also help us to gauge the level of existing knowledge in a group. 
Uh, so based on the result of the group self-assessment, we decided on four topics to have a, a bit of a deep dive throughout the year. Um, while the topics are decided collectively by the data champions, um, the sessions are um, open to everyone in the Curtin Research community. Um, so for uh, topics that didn't get picked, um, the data champions will have their own individual results. Um, so they can look into the topics for um, uh, or uh, related resources themselves. Um, I, I will talk a little bit more about the self-assessment tool um, in a minute. Um, and I also replaced the fortnightly meetings um, with optional monthly meetups and uh, Microsoft Teams conversations to cater for those who are not actually physically based in Perth. We um, will again run the annual forum in February uh, next year to finalise this year's program. So the deep dive sessions that we decided to run this year are um, on data documentation and description. Um, so we talked about um, metadata and the information that um, we should uh, keep um, to enable data can be reused effectively for our collaborators and other researchers or even the researchers themselves. Um, and the second session was on uh, fashion control. Um, so we had a, um, we shared stories and had conversations about fashion controls for uh, a strategy for uh, data, uh, documents and code. Uh, in particular, data versioning uh, was the topic of interest and uh, even our most experienced uh, data champions are, are really grappling with uh, data versioning. So that was a really interesting session. Uh, the third session is on data retention and preservation. Um, it's actually happening tomorrow. Uh, we will discuss what data needs to be kept for how long and um, where should we keep it. Um, and also to ensure data and digital objects can be accessed and, re, uh, and used you know, for the long term. The fourth session um, is on Indigenous data. Um, so this will uh, be held in late November or early December. Um, so we are currently planning for this session. Um, we're going to invite um, uh, speakers to talk about their research um, and share their approach to um, handling and managing uh, Indigenous research data. Um, okay, so the main reason for data champions to join the program is to learn more and to improve the data management practice. Um, so the training component is very important, uh, but it's also one of the key challenges um, for us to, to coordinate. Um, so as I mentioned before, last year we um, put together four three-hour training sessions um, as part of onboarding, and that was over a two-week period. Um, so they, the sessions cover all of the topics that we thought we were, uh, that we thought were in scope. Uh, the problem with that approach is that not all topics are relevant to everyone. Uh, say an astronomer isn't going to be interested in a deep conversation about sensitive health data and ethical consideration um, around it. Um, and there's also a, a different level uh, of existing knowledge in the group. So for those who don't have much existing uh, knowledge, um, there was quite a lot of information to digest and take in um, during those two weeks. Um, so this year we have an even bigger group with more diverse background and existing knowledge. So. Um, Instead of running the intensive training sessions, we had the motivation to, de to develop a, a tool that um, not only can give the data champions an overview of the key topics that they should know about, but also to give uh, themselves and us an idea about the level of knowledge on um, uh, existing, existing knowledge on those topics. Uh, we can then spread out the training sessions uh, throughout the year. Um, 
which makes them easier to manage um, and digest. Um, so with this approach, we have to prioritise topics to, um, to run because we can't do, uh, run all of the topics that everyone wants to do. Um, so they can, uh, so uh, as I mentioned before, for the, the topics that didn't get picked, um, research data champions can um, uh, identify resources and uh, training opportunity to develop the skills um, in the other areas. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the self-assessment tool. Um, we developed the tool um, that covers a broad range of topics and um, uh, and we try to classify those topics under five sections. Um, so the first one's on general knowledge. So that covers um, things like, you know, what is research data? Um, have you heard of the FAIR principles and, and that sort of things? Um, or organization and retentions on, um, you know, data documentation and data retention. How long do you think you need to keep your data for? Um, and the third topic, uh, third section is on um, writing uh, and, and analysis. This is about version control and how to manage your files and uh, the, the analysis workflows, um, things like that. Data sharing um, is, um, so data sharing covers topics that are around data ownership, um, licensing and, and uh, IP issue. Uh, sensitive data, um, of course, talks about, you know, do you know how to de-identify your data um, and also, you know, health and cultural sen culturally sensitive data um, as well. So the tool attempts to provide participants with uh, practices at uh, four levels of uh, experience. So um, they are newbie, amateur, pro and hero. Um, so we try to keep it a bit lighthearted. Um, so the goal is to help everyone in the um, program to move up to at least the pro level. Um, and if they are already at heroes um, level in some areas, then I will um, talk them into planning some of the deep dive sessions. Uh, with me and I have been quite successful. Um, they, they are just a, a group of people who are very willing and generous to share the knowledge. Um, so here is an example of how the self-assessment tool is worded. Um, so the tool contains statements that represent the behavior or practice at various experience levels. Um, so uh, instead of just asking the respondents to rate themselves on the scale from one to five, we gave some um, examples to help people to choose uh, the appropriate levels uh, for themselves. So um, hopefully this can help prevent them from uh, under or overrating themselves. Uh, so this is an example for um, uh, the data ownership topic. So we have published the self-assessment tool to Zenodo uh, under a Creative Commons license. So we welcome the community to reuse and adapt it. Uh, we plan to continue to develop the tool in the future. Uh, we would like to uh, integrate some recommendation uh, functionality to the tool so users can get some resources recommended to them immediately um, uh, as they are completing the, the uh, questions. Um, we would like to also add further relevant areas of um, RDM behaviors or topics um, to the tool um, because we know that we haven't actually covered everything. Um, so yeah, it will be good to uh, continue to build on and, and expand on that. Um, so we are approaching the end of 2021 and uh, I'm already reflecting on how uh, it's been um, going and uh, also thinking about uh, how we would like to run it next year. Um, we have um, had quite a few more data champions joined us this year. Um, in a sense, it, this is really good, um, but it also means that it's much harder to maintain the personal uh, relationship like I had with the 2020 um, participants. Um, and I'm still uh, trying to 
balanced time commitment that I ask of people and um, the right level of um, engagement activities to achieve our objective. Um, so people are time poor. Um, we, uh, I, I would like them to see the value um, of this program so that they will make uh, or find the time to engage or fully engage. Um, I found that this year um, by making meetings and engagement activities optional and increasing flexibility doesn't actually increase engagement. Um, it increases the number of people who uh, um, would join the program, um, but I, I think it seems um, that it is ex at the expense of them seeing the participation as optional. Um, so in terms of in terms of expectation management, um, last year I actually met with the data champions one on one before they joined the uh, the program. Uh, this year's recruitment was streamlined, and um, we developed a, a form, an online form. Um, so we asked researchers to take a look at the information um, information sheet that we provided, um, and which outlined you know what we offer. Um, what are the expectations and they share what they would like to get out of um, the program. Um, but it, it is quite clear to me that that communication method isn't enough um, and the one on one conversation worked a lot better. Um, so I've um, mentioned that we've got some remote participants this year, which is fantastic. Um, but uh, I found it really challenging to coordinate blended workshop, which um, means workshops with, that has both in-person and online <clears throat> uh, participants. Um, we don't have the resources to run separate sessions, especially um, when we have guest speakers who are already uh, helping and providing the um, knowledge uh, for free. Um, so um, yeah, it's, it's very difficult um, to, to run hybrid sessions and events. Um, if anyone who has attended and organized this type of hybrid events, you know that it's quite difficult to balance the interactions between um, the participants who are, uh, are visiting in person and also uh, online. So, uh, you know, interesting enough, that wasn't a problem last year when everything was online. Um, Okay, so next year, um, it is very likely that uh, we will continue to run this program uh, in 2022. Um, I'm planning on reintroducing some of what we did in 2020. Uh, it took me more time at the setup phase, but I, I think it's definitely worthwhile as we can um, make sure that everyone who joined the program is clear about what we're here for. Um, so uh, next year, I will uh, uh, meet with the data champions before they join the program to communicate um, our objectives and also to have a better understanding of their expectation and their needs. Um, I will also likely reduce the size of the group um, and add more engagement activities um, that require attendance similar to the 2020 um, program. Uh, what I'll keep from this year is uh, to continue to make use of the self-assessment tool. Uh, and like I said before, we'll continue to build on that tool um, and then spread out the training component throughout the year. Um, I, I think I'll um, stop there. Um, I'm happy to take questions or have a discussion. Thank you, Janice. Uh, very interesting uh, talk and um, it's a learning experience also for you <laughs> year after year. Um, any, any question, anyone for Janice? Well, we start with Levi, who left a question in the chat. Uh, so which part of the uni is supporting or driving this program? Um, so I'm based in the library and is initiated and led by the library. 
Um, but we uh, definitely need to engage with our IT area and our research office and our records area um, because research data management support is really uh, across department uh, effort. So yeah, we definitely try uh, to bring together um, the research support staff as well. Oh, and also our um, CIC, which is the Curtin Institute for Computation, um, they run a lot of uh they, they run software carpentry they do hacky hours and drop-in sessions and they have been uh, like a champion for this program as well so um yeah definitely a, a collaborative effort but led by the library thanks any more question i have one actually so I remember when you presented um, the research data pro data management program last year at eResearch Australasia. I think mm -hmm. someone made a comment. I think your cohort was only composed of early and micro researchers, or mostly composed mm -hmm. of early and micro researchers. And someone made a comment that maybe it was the best way also to change practices in the lab. Um, do you think? Do you agree with that? And do you see that this year, for example, you had a number of HDR students? Do you see that um, that could also affect the, 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 um, the success of the program in terms of changing practices? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Yeah, last year we did um, target our early career researchers in, in our um, uh, recruitment uh, because we thought that the, the incentives that, that we provided them um, will be most appealing. Um, and like you said, we can also change practice uh, earlier on. Um, and um, I, I have to say they have been very engaged, but I also uh, want to add that there are also the, uh, maybe uh, my, from my observation, probably uh, the, the busier group of researchers as well, because they are putting their hand up to do uh, a lot of a lot of things. So um, they they have been fantastic, um, and they have helped with organising uh, and get their uh, colleagues to join some of the events that we uh, ran. Uh, they are very proactive in sharing their challenges and issues around data management in the area. Um, so, and, and I think that might be one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why we wanted to um, open it up to uh, HDR students as well. Um, so we've got uh, a few of them this year and look, they, they are very open to learning, um, which is great. Um, we haven't actually seen the impact of it yet, obviously, because um, a lot of them are just starting out. So they are really sort of trying to learn everything and um, do the right thing, um, if, if you like. So um, yeah, so they, they have been um, really great at attending all of the sessions and, and you know, asking great questions, but um, we, we really do rely on the, the researchers or um, academic staff who would do the, uh, like the more of the engagement side of it. So yeah, I mean, in terms of the impact of it, um, I think it might be a bit early to, to say, um, yeah. Yeah, I understand. Any, any question, anyone? You can either ask the question directly or leave it in the chat. Or a comment, or maybe I can ask a question. <laughs> what, what would be a good incentive for you to join a program like this? That is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think might as well. <laughs> I, I think there's, there's one thing that you stressed is that is very true is people are time poor and you need to have a good incentive and i think compliance cannot be the only incentive no yeah i guess i was going to ask a sort of similar question you know just because you've had that kind of quite motivated uh, cohort that you might think are kind of on that early adopter end of a bell curvy mm -hmm. you know sort of thing <laughs> i guess i was sort of curious to think about it um 
you know, in, in terms of, I guess, what's their reported pain points um, of, of why, you know, where they were like, oh, this just takes forever and I don't feel like there's enough of a reward for it in, in you know, I guess I was thinking if, if a highly motivated group still comes up with those types of pain points. Um, and then obviously, you know, for our end, um, you know, what can we, because, you know, obviously thinking about it from, from central research facilities, it's then what are some of the practices or changes to the, um, to how we're supporting researchers that might enable um, a reduction of that pain? <laughs> yeah, um, the <laughs> everyone's pain point is quite different, I think. Um, I, and a lot of them we can't really solve. Uh, I think we, people talk a lot about the admin burden uh, and, a, and a compliance requirement. And also, you know, there are some lack of resources um, for some issues as well. Um, but it's really great to hear about um, the challenges because we can really slowly working on improving those things um, and having clearer guidance. Um, and in terms of, um, difficulties in joining the program, you know, it is time and also um, I, everyone's too polite to uh, tell me this, I know that, um, but I think at, at one point, um, one of them said to me, you know, uh, this is all goodwill and it, it will run out. <laughs> which I completely understand. And that's why I'm really keen to hear, you know, what kind of rewards would work for these, um, you know, so, so far we are sort of offering these, you know, little public profile um, and also um, opportunity to, to uh, meet with other uh, researchers in other areas. And I know that they've met researchers who are in other areas that they've never thought they would meet and they are thinking about collaborations. Uh, uh, and that's, that's great, um, but uh, it's probably not, um, you know, not everyone's getting that um, reward. Um, so yeah, I'm really keen to hear, um, you know, that, you know, from the researchers who are in the audience, you know, what, what would be a good incentive to participate in this program, uh, in addition to all the goodwill <laughs> yeah, and no, good it's, tea. It, it, it's a tricky part. I mean, I've, I've asked a number of times a number of people whether they had like um, good stories about data management, you know, uh, I had good practices in data management and therefore that allowed me to do X, Y, or Z, or to develop such great collaborations and everything. And that may have happened, but the thing is that the people who promote data management, those stories never come to, to, to them, so they don't know. <laughs> and, and even the <laughs> maybe publicize those stories. Yeah. And even the universities often don't, are not aware whether mm. their training was successful in this way. So um, it, it's very difficult. And same for FAIR, you know, um, promotion of the FAIR principles. Um, philosophically, a lot of people are on board. But if you look at the way funding, research funding works, um, a researcher promoting FAIR is not rewarded by the ARC or the NHMRC. Mm. Kind of the opposite, actually, because you know you don't want to share your data. <laughs> so it's it's and then it, I know it's been raised several times, but it's it's a complete it complete change or so in, in the way funders yeah. work. Yeah, yeah. What I found is um, most of the data champions are really interested in the fair principles and, and applying it to uh, improve the data management practice. So. Um, the, uh, uh, basically that came out of last year. So I designed uh, a workshop um, just on FAIR uh, and introducing FAIR principles and basically for researchers who come along to the session to come up with some steps to make their data more FAIR. Um, so we've had really good feedback on, on that. So, you know, maybe maybe data sharing is, is something that we, we really wanted to advocate, but Fair, fair data or fair principles is um, perhaps seen as a more practical um, mm. thing to learn more about because it really benefits uh, everyone. Um, so, you know, not, not just thinking about data. Uh, Sandy suggested maybe some sort of certification for HDR students. Oh. 
I think we might have lost Janice. Oh, oh, we've lost the speaker. <laughs> um, I think um, the the only question that maybe I'd wondered about was, um, you know, I, I still think within sort of the academic context, trying to work out where the place is for data sets, right, as a as a as an output of academic achievement. I'm not always sure that data sets are regarded, they're certainly not funded in the same way as publications when you think about track record. And so I wonder about recognition of data sets as outputs. Um, you know, I think I've heard that from the ARDC as, as, as well. Like how, sorry, Janice, I was just saying like, how do you give recognition, I guess, to publish data sets? Um, as a as you know as something that academia recognizes as an output like it recognizes publications to try and change a bit of the the mindset um but that, you know I'm, I'm not quite sure how you would then you know do that or whether you'd have like a best <laughs> i don't know best data set from a hdr student i mean i'm not even sure how you would approach trying to uh, judge such a thing um but uh, yeah i mean maybe some sort of at least you know award or acknowledgement or something like that of their participation for um you know their their cv might be um another way like sandy suggested there with a, a certification type approach or at least mm. yeah some recognition of their um Oh, is it is it part of the milestones of when a PhD student enrolls and when a PhD student enrolls? Sorry, is it part of their milestones to to do some data management courses or something like that? Uh, so for us, uh, no, not not a course, but um, at Curtin. Um, a uh, higher degree by research students, they have to complete and submit a uh, data management plans at milestone one, which is candidacy. Um, so that that is usually when we um, would first um, hear from them. <laughs> oh, and welcome back. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I don't know when I I lost connection, um, but this this room, um, I always have trouble. <laughs> Sorry. I don't, I don't know if you, uh, uh, what, I can't even remember what I was talking about. I think I might be talking about the FAIR workshop yeah. that I, yeah. So that was quite popular. Uh, any more question, anyone? Or a Biggest comment? data set award. <laughs> but it, I mean, it's, it is quite interesting because when, I mean, it's, it's only now that, um, data as a research output is being considered which is kind of crazy because research is supposed to be driven by data <laughs> uh, but it's it's so it it may be when things are going to change when when track record like when publications and data will be seen as equal and therefore what you do with data will become important yeah, yeah, I, I really wish to see um, more incentive at higher level at like DARC and NHMRC and also at institutional level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because otherwise, you know, researchers have so many things or boxes that they need to take, um, they'll have to choose. Yeah, that's true. Um, mm -hmm. Well, if there is no more question, um, then I think uh, we can all thank um, Janice for, for this very interesting talk. Um, and um, thank you all for, for attending. And see you next month for a macro chat or a webinar. Haven't decided yet. Thank you all. See you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Janice. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.